Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio. After midnight tonight, David Omen. What a great name that is for a spooky story, Omen. David Omen, he lives in what might be one of the world's most haunted houses, on a site where the Charles Manson murders that shocked the 60s happened, uh, pretty close to it, a hundred feet away, and pretty spooky stuff just keeps on happening there. We'll talk about that. It is pretty bloody material, so if you're easily uh, scared by things, if you are squeamish, then the midnight hour is not for you. If you like this kind of stuff, then it definitely is. You can connect with us anytime here on Talk Radio, 0344 499 1000 by phone, on the Twitter, at Talk Radio, or you can text TALK and then a space and your message to 87222. Something's just fallen over there. No idea what it was. So get set for resourcefully rapid-fire roller coaster randomized reality radio for a Sunday night. This is The Unexplained, dateline the 5th of July, 2020. The Unexplained, with Howard Hughes. Talk Radio. The Unexplained, with Howard Hughes, on Talk Radio. The Unexplained hits midnight. It is now officially Monday morning. And frankly, after three and a half months as it is now in lockdown, all I know that it's sometime at the beginning of July. I'll check calendar later. It doesn't really matter now. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer or warning, I'd say, really, before we get into the topic that we're going to discuss in this hour. Some of the things that we will talk about involve people being murdered in a quite bloody, horrendous and horrific way. Um, if you are disturbed or upset by the mention of such things, and of course, you know, we're not going to give you in-depth details of everything because those things you can read on the internet and see wherever you like but if you are disturbed by any suggestion or hint of these things maybe this hour is not for you um thank you very much before i get into the content this hour by the way if you've emailed me recently very kind of you your guest suggestions recently especially during lockdown have included the man we're about to speak with so you can always get in touch with me go to my website theunexplained.tv email me from there this man's name is David Oman, and he lives in what I guess here in the United Kingdom, because we have uh, phrases that underplay things here. He lives in a notorious location. It's a location in Los Angeles that is close to the scene of some terrible crimes. Uh, the, the Sharon Tate Manson killings were maybe a mile marker in the way that uh, we looked at ourselves and the world and entertainment and just about everything. I think, although maybe this is too heavy and big a statement for somebody like me to make, I think those crimes were the point at which the flowery dreamings of the flower power and psychedelia era came to an abrupt and bloody end. People woke up from it all. But if we are to believe what David is about to tell us, those crimes and a legacy, a legacy that is very real and very tangible in paranormal activity. David Oman, um, thank you very much for listening to all of that. Please pick me up or correct me on anything I got wrong there. No, as a matter of fact, Howard, first, thank you for having me on your show today and or this evening. And again, everything you got was absolutely positively on the mark. Um, my house actually sits about 100 yards or 100 meters from where the Sharon Tate murders took place 51 years ago in five weeks from tonight, as a matter of fact. Um, and my house is crazy. It has crazy activity. And I mean... I've had things happen that most people, as I've been, as I've told them, would would basically run out of the house and never return because of the amount of um, incidents that have taken place here that I've witnessed and others have witnessed. And um, it is, it is, as you said, a tragedy. It's a, one of the most horrific tragedies of the 20th century, on a small scale. When you talk about one person leading a small group of people to do such violent, vicious crimes and murders. Um, it's uh, it's kind of, um, as I'd like to say, it stained the history as we know it all over the world because when those crimes took place and Sharon Tate was killed some 51 years ago, it wasn't isolated to just the U.S. that knew about it. It was a worldwide phenomenon. And why I say that is because 
in the time of doing research about the house and the area, I found newspaper articles back from 51 years ago in South America, South Africa, in Australia, in the UK, across the European continent, even I would have to say probably in Russia they might have even heard about her mm-hmm. then because the, just the notoriousness and the the way that the crime was committed with such brutality in such a heinous manner that people were like saying, but she was eight and a half months pregnant mm-hmm. and they stabbed her 16 times. I mean, it, now obviously fast forward to the present day, it's, I don't want to say it's common, but it's less... Um, it less, it's, it's less scary, it's less traumatizing. But in the 1969, in that era, it set up against the backdrop of the flower power movement and the peace, love, and war movement, etc. It's just, it ran diametrically opposed to that era. Well, and it, it did. Was- and, and as I said, David, you know, it was the thing, I think, that made people wake up. You know, it was like they'd been having a, a real nice dream. Maybe they'd been to a party or had a nice night out. And this is like the most abrupt wake-up call that the world could have had. And I think the reason, and we will talk about, because we have to refresh people's memories here, we will talk about the details of those crimes, just to, you know, not in great deep detail, but just enough to be able to explain to people, and also to a younger generation. It's not just to people who are in the United Kingdom listening to this. It's going to be to a younger generation who may have the foggiest idea, but only a foggy idea of what this is. So we, we need to be doing that. But like I said, this crime was something that that shocked people to the core. And there is this, as you said, international interest, certainly here in the United Kingdom, right across Europe and in all kinds of places. Because I think at some kind of deep level, people are horrified, horrified and fascinated. And often those things can go together. They're horrified and fascinated by the depths to which certain human souls can sink you know they they obviously they're not capable the people reading about these crimes they're not capable of them themselves but they are fascinated and scared as i would be scared reading these details and was that such things can happen in this world that we thought was nice i I think that's what it is but you tell me i i think you hit the nail on the head i think that at the time, it was so out of the blue and so completely unexpected. And because Sharon had been to Europe and was in the UK filming a movie called 13 earlier, and I think David Niven was in it, and there were a couple of other famous English actresses, actors that were in this movie, that she was a... I don't want to say a worldwide phenomena, but the murder struck a chord worldwide because people were familiar with her story and her love affair with Roman Polanski. And because she was in Europe, as I just said, I just remembered, she worked on the movie The Fearless Vampire Slayers with Roman Polanski. And I think they shot that in Poland. Um, so again, the, the fact that she transcended a large swath of this planet when she was alive that the fact that when she was killed Hmm. it was just horrendous people as you said they were fascinated and still are fascinated by the tragedy that took place because after the movie once upon a time in hollywood came out last year um this might might where i lived literally down the driveway from her house was been swamped and swarmed with tourists and looky-loos to the point where in the, the first three months of the movie we were getting about 200 i'd say about 100 cars a day driving up here and i mean day day and night middle of the night middle of the day there would be throngs of cars driving up here to see where it took place Mm, and and that's a fascinating thing that i've reflected on before in broadcasts that i've done not always on this show but on other you know broadcasts that i've made that sometimes people want to go to see the location where a bad thing happened exactly almost to they feel easier to know that this is not a fantasy and it also reassures them in their own safety in other words there's a little maybe this is going too deep into the psyche and the psychology of it but there's a bit of a feeling of well you know that's that's interesting and isn't that terrible and thank god that wasn't me 
Exactly. I think you're exactly right. But the thing about this, what took place, the tragedy that befell them down the driveway here is the fact that you come up here and the people look around and say, oh, my God, this is this is this is craziness because now 50 years later there's one two three four houses that are now up here and i when i meet people that drive up here and i say well you have to remember at the time of the murders it was pretty isolated there was the house at the end of this drive which mm -hmm. is where sharon resided there was a house outside of her property maybe about 50 feet from her from the gate that was there and then another 50 feet down from that was another house and then it was empty to right. the very, very, and very we, bottom we have of the to driveway. Give people, a, a sound picture of this place. Uh, we yes. haven't named the drive. It's Cielo Drive, right. isn't it? That's, that's yes. I think that's how you pronounce that. Yes, um, Cielo. And it became internationally famous, uh, actually infamous, for the events there. And as you say, it was uh, a part of Los Angeles that was, um, you know, quite um, select. And quite um, not exactly isolated because nobody nowhere there is really, but you know away from from the rest of it. And I always had this view whenever I watched old newsreels of this uh, location. And you you are living along that drive, and yeah. that's why we're talking now. Uh, I always had this view that um, they were the kind of houses that you would probably see Henry Fonda and his family in some, uh, you know, he had a TV series where he played a cop in the 70s. And he was a good, clean cop with a great big smile. And, you know, his badge on display in his jacket and his family all around him. I kept expecting to see Henry Fonda bound out of one of those houses. They were, they are, the all-American home. Yeah, well, as, as a matter of fact, the irony that you mentioned Henry Fonda is the fact that he actually was one of the residents at that house in the 50s, I do believe. Well, do you know something? I, I didn't, I had no idea of that, you know? I, I, that uh, is, isn't that weird synchronicity? All right. So that's the yes. location. Um, yes. Give me the details then, just a, a thumbnail sketch of the crimes that will be central to that which we are about to discuss, if you see what I'm saying. Sure. Um, well, on August 8th, 1969, Sharon Tate and her ex-fiance, J.C., bring hairstylist to the stars, and... Her, who and, and we have to say, Sharon Tate, just for those young people, those who may have forgotten, Sharon Tate, up-and-coming movie star. Right. Up and coming film star. She had done a few motion pictures. She was famous for doing a film called um, Valley of the Dolls, which was her dramatic film that she had done. That was her outbreak film. She had done some other roles with her, her husband, Roman Glansky, one of them called The Fearless Vampire Slayers. Um, let's see. She'd done a movie with uh, Tony Curtis. It was a film that was a beach film, so it wasn't high in content, but a lot of visual and a lot of B and B, boobs and bums, you know. <laughs> I, um, I think we it, can relate to that in the United Kingdom. Those those words are quintessentially British, but better than the alternative. Okay, David. Course. So so she was in a variety of films, and obviously right. you have to do certain films to establish your career. If you have to do a beach jolly beach movie to get to you where do. you want to be, then you do it. Exactly. And so she had done that and she was coming up into her own as a, as a very, very qualified actress from her serious dramatic role in, again, Valley of the Dolls. Well, on the 8th of August, the evening of, she and her friend J.C. bring her ex-fiance who lived up the street and her dear, guest, I guess her best friend, Abigail Folger of the Folger's Coffee Empire, um, and her boyfriend, Wojciech Vykowski, were at the home at 10,051 Cielo Drive, which is at the end of the driveway from where I, I'm talking to you right now at. And um, Charles Manson had basically, who was an, a drifter and now a guru to a group of people that lived in the San Fernando Valley, they were called the family. Him and his cohorts basically went upon the murder spree that started on the 8th into the 9th of August, 1969, and basically laid waste to Sharon Tate, who was eight and a half months pregnant, her ex-fiancé, Jay Sebring, their friends, Abigail Folger and Wojciech Frykowski, and, of course, the odd person out that was not part of their group who was visiting the caretaker, William Gerritsen, were all horrendously 
slaughtered mm. at the house down the street from my place right now. Um, Sharon was stabbed some 16 times. She had multiple additional lacerations and defensive wounds to her forearms. Um, Jay Sebring was shot five times, was shot multiple times and stabbed to death. Stephen Parent was shot five times point blank range in the entrance of the driveway as he was trying to leave. Um, Abigail Folger was stabbed, I forgot how many times, but a number of times, so much so that her white nightgown was stained completely red from the blood. I mean, look, this is, and we have to once again say to our listeners here, it, it is after midnight, so I hope you listen to what I said at the beginning of this, that if you find such details difficult, then tune out right now and come back later. But, you know, this was, we have to tell you this because this was an horrendous crime. It not only shocked America, news got out really quickly, it absolutely shocked the world. But the thing about this, David, is, and I'm sorry just to jump in here for, sure. for that reason and for this reason, uh, Manson himself, and this was a fact that I'd forgotten until I did a, an interview with an author last year who'd written a book about the 50th anniversary of this crime. Manson himself was not actually part of that rampage. Right. He sent them on their, he gave them their marching orders um, to commit the crimes. And a lot of people said he's a psychopath. And I said, no, 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 no. The difference between a psychopath and a sociopath is the psychopath enjoys and revels in the opportunity to get his fingers literally drenched with blood. The sociopath, on the other hand, derives a certain thrill of the ability to make other people do the deed, and in so doing, he has no physical blood upon his hands even though he has instructed these people to commit the heinous crime. Charles Manson was a sociopath. David Oman, we're talking about the terrible events in Cielo Drive, Los Angeles, a long time ago, that left a deep scar and impact on the world and changed many, many lives. And the name Charles Manson, of course, written into infamy. But this all has a ramification today because David lives at an address on that drive that is deeply, he says, deeply haunted and almost possessed by those events there. More about this coming right up here on The Unexplained at Talk Radio. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes, Monday morning, straight back to David Oman in Los Angeles. And we were just concluding the story of Charles Manson and the events on Cielo Drive that uh, horrified the world. Of course they did and continue so to do. And you were saying that Manson... <sighs> The word I'm getting in my head is wannabe. He wanted yes. to be famous. He was able, because this is Los Angeles, it was the 60s, he was able to associate with people who were famous. But it must have rankled with him massively that he didn't get to where they got and he didn't have what they had. Yeah, well, what happened was, is he was, I hate to say he was misled or he was led to believe that he was on the path, which was because... When he met Brian Wilson, he had shown him some of his lyrics, and Brian had said, or expressed his interest in saying, you know something, this, these lyrics, these actually might be lyrics to a song we can actually, you know. So he was given, I hate to say he was afforded the opportunity that he would be believing that Brian Wilson was going to develop this, his music, his lyrics, and some of his writings. And that's when he started to believe seriously that he had chops and the chomps to do this. And so when Brian brought him around all these parties, you got to remember that the people that were named on the Charles Manson hit list were people that Charles Manson had met and had spoken to. And most of those people he had come, come across because of the parties that he went to with Brian Wilson. So that... What I kind of got gathered when I was reading Helter Skelter as, you know, later on in you know, the past couple of years, I started realizing, wait a second, you have the dynamic set up for Charles Manson to believe that he's going up to his path to, to ascend the mountain to get his piece of, of you know, of uh, success. And what happened was it's a twist of fate. Brian Wilson had released, or the Beach Boys had released the album Pet Sounds, which is I use the analogy of Phil Spector in the early 60s created the wall of sound. When Phil Spector's music hit the airwaves, every group, music group, ran to Phil Spector to produce his albums. Mm. And, and, and of course, the, musically, 
the Pet Sounds album was the the Beach Boys version of uh, Sgt. Pepper. It was a defining, exactly. you know, of that era, it was the defining album. Exactly, and that's exactly what it was. It was something so intrinsically brand new that brought everybody's attention to Brian Wilson, just like what John Lennon and Paul McCartney had done with Sgt. Pepper's brought them all that attention and everybody wanted them to produce albums. Same with Brian. So Brian now was inundated with requests to produce other people's albums and Manson started getting, as I would say, impatient. And he couldn't stand still in the fact that Brian's busy. I have to wait for Brian to get unbusy to then get to working on my projects. Mm. But in the meantime, it sounds to me like Brian was just... Manson had an in, so he knew him as many other people knew him. And, you know, Brian sounds like he was just being uh, as many people in the entertainment industry that I've known through my life. You know, just being nice by saying, you know, we will look at some of your songs here. It's not saying we're going to make you a, a, a platinum album. It's just saying, well, you know, if we get some time, we'll look at your songs. Sounds to me. It, it was, but it was even further than that, because, in fact, Brian did include one of Manson's songs on the album, one of the albums of the Beach Boys, apparently, and didn't give Manson credit for it, I don't believe. I think that was the story. But the bottom line is, is that, no, there was a, there was a tremendous interest and curiosity from Brian Wilson. It was a two-way street in the beginning. Mm, okay, all right. So, here we have somebody, then, who has issues um yes and they're very serious issues and those issues are principally the ones that you would see and experience issues of resentment i can't you know in a city where people are famous in the place where entertainment is king i can't really be that and i don't see why this is not fair so you've got all of that seething resentment which i guess percolates through to this man's followers because he's clearly charismatic in an evil kind of way yes. and then those events transpire uh, what exactly who, who was brought to justice for this because manson you didn't go to the electric chair for this he wasn't executed was he no well they were all committed to the death penalty they all received the death penalty in 1970 after the trial was con commissioned but what happened was is that manson and the others were basically had their sentences committed to life in prison but with the possibility of parole because the California legislature in 1971 or 72 basically dismissed the death penalty. Right. So, so they, he, the death they penalty was, was, was out dismissed. of time, was abolished. Abolished, right. So what was it then? For Manson, life in prison? Life in prison, but they kept on coming up for parole. And a small tidbit of information that nobody seems to know, or few people know, is that after the murders were committed, and they were they started about midnight the 8th into the 9th of August, Friday night into Saturday morning, and um, they were finished, the, the murders com were com completed by about 12, 20, 12, 30. Um, Manson came back to the crime scene at about two in the morning with an accomplice to see the disposition of the crime scene. And this is, there's, there's some corroborating facts to this that'll, that people can figure and find out when you read the book Helter Skelter. Manson said to the family the following night saying, I want you to commit to be more witchy. And he was referring to the way that Chris disposition of the crime scene was the night before so you remember, nobody had cameras that were taking photographs on their cell phones of the crime scene. So Manson had no idea of what the disposition of the crime scene was had he not been there. And he basically said to them, I want it to be done this way with more this and more that. So he gave them specific instructions based upon what he had seen the night before. That's the one in one point of reference. The second was is that the police know for a fact that somebody came back to the site at between 1.30 and 2.30 in the morning because the neighbors or the, I guess, there were witnesses from around the area that heard two men arguing late in the evening. And it was coming up from the Tate House where the mur at about between 1.30 and 2 in the morning. Secondly, Susan Atkins... The reason why the murders were so slow in being, as we say, in um, the process of being uncovered was because when Susan Atkins had described the crime scene to her cellmate, Ronnie Howard, 
She did not mention a word about the rope that was drift, drift over the was draped over the rafters and the beams in the house that connected Sharon Tate's body to Jay Sebring's body. And that's because they didn't do that. That was done after the murders were committed. Oh, hold on, then. So, so yes. did, are we saying that people admitted to something who hadn't done it? No, no, no. They admitted to what they admitted, but the disposition of the crime scene, as she related it to her cellmate, Ronnie Howard, mm -hmm. did not match the crime scene that was left after when it was discovered by the right. police. So, the as morning. you say, somebody else had been in there and had adulterated yes. the crime scene. Yes, and Vincent Bugliosi, who a friend of mine who was a producer made a movie with, asked Vincent, and Vincent said, oh, I, don't, I know somebody came back to the crime scene after the murders were committed, but Vincent, to his dying day, didn't believe that Manson was the one, was one of the people that returned to the crime scene. And I said, because he, he, he thought that you know, he would expose himself to being potentially caught, and I said, however, Vincent... The, the crime scene is two-tenths of a mile up a private driveway off the main street. The cops would have barricaded the bottom of the driveway and allowed traffic to continue up and down Cielo Drive proper because there were too many houses that had nothing to do with the crime scene since it was on an isolated private drive off the main street. Secondly, he, we know that the police reports show that there was bloodstain evidence that's in the backyard that only matches Sharon and Jay's blood type, but there's no bodies. And at the front door, there's a pool of blood that is a mixture of both Sharon Tate's blood and Jay Sebring's blood. So what happened was is that Manson and his, his accomplice dragged Sharon Tate's body from the living room with also with Jay Sebring's body. They stopped at the front door at the porch, at the front air, at the, right at the entryway. Blood pulled up as it was coming off of their bodies. They took them into the backyard. My theory is they tried to put them into a pseudo-sexual position. And they couldn't because the bodies were basically were, had rigor mortis set in. Okay, I, I think that really I, I, that illustrates what we're talking about here: the depths of depravity and evil right, right. that we're seeing. I don't think we have to go into any more detail than that. Right. No, uh, that's fine. Part, exactly. Partly because it's absolutely horrible, right. and you know, my listener can read about that if if they want to. But right. I'm going to spare other listeners sure. further details unless unless we really need to to go into no. this more then we can. So we understand right. that this is the most heinous of crimes. There are right. very few crimes in history that are, that are as bad, as incomprehensible as this one. And a bunch yeah. of people ended up in jail. Manson himself, in the land of the death penalty, did not experience the death penalty. So, so what, what happened to him? Just remind us of how he ultimately expired, because people are going to want to remember that. I think it's three years ago now yeah. he died of old age. Uh, wow. Susan Atkins died of a brain, an operable t brain tumor a few years earlier. And the rest, Tex Watson, uh, Patricia Krenwinkel, um, Leslie Van Houten are still very much in jail. Right. Okay. Now, yes. there is a connection, a big one. And a chilling one between you and all of this, which is why we've told this story. Yes. Because here's a guy, David Oman, who is interested in paranormality, but actually acquires a house very close to the crime scene. Um, talk to me about that. Pro talk to me about you and talk to me about sure. that process. Well, I've always been fascinated by the paranormal since I was a child and had my first I guess you'd say inexperience, you know, with a, with a spirit. Um, I was five years old. I ran into my parents' bed in the middle of the night because I was scared of something. I remember falling asleep and then a few hours later waking up in the middle of the night and sitting up in the bed in between my mother and my father and looking to my right at about four and a half, five feet off the ground, I saw an object that just manifested out of the door and it was a ball of red, green, and blue light. And it was not blinking, but it was illuminated, and it was floating. And it went around the perimeter, semicircle around the front of the bed, in front of me, all the way around to the other door, and then disappeared. Ever since then, I've been fascinated by the paranormal. Um, and to, to, make, to correct you on something, my, I actually didn't buy a house. I bought a lot. 
21 years ago in 1999 with my father, um, who found it on a Sunday morning in the classified section as a piece of real estate that was a lot, vacant lot for sale on a foreclosure for okay. $40,000. Wow. Okay. Well, in that uh, in that area, real estate for $40,000 is, uh, is cheap by anybody's and standard. However, didn't you look at the address? Yeah, well, it was down the street. I, I, he calls me up at eight in the morning on a Sunday morning, says, get up. I found a lot. It's like, Dad, it's eight in the morning. It's $40,000. It's in Beverly. I said, Beverly Hills, $40,000. I said, Dad, is it say 40K for 40? He goes, yes. I said, it's a misprint. It's missing a zero. They, 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 they misprinted it. He goes, no, I don't think so. Get up and meet me. I said, all right, fine. So I got up. I drove up to this location and i remember hearing the name cielo try and saying see why does that sound so familiar and yes i had read helter skelton had been up here when i was a kid in high school to see where the infamous manson murders had taken place because we had all read helter skelton it was in the neighborhood so to speak so 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 didn't up, didn't you you know as any of us might have said didn't you say now i understand why this is forty thousand dollars and not a uh, hundred thousand dollars or more well, the reason why I said to him on the phone, I said, it must be a vertical slope. I said, there's no such thing as a piece of empty real estate in Beverly Hills. That's $40,000. And how close to the events, how close to the location of the events is this piece of real estate? Um, it's about 150 feet down from where the house, where the property began and stood. Gee, I thought you were going to say a quarter of a mile. It's 150 oh, no. feet away. Oh, yeah. it's. And the thing is, is that in 1994 they tore the house down the tate property and bulldozed from one end of the property and i think it's two acres flat at the end of the street to the other end of the property and bulldozed and flipped the earth three feet but they left two bearing walls and the floor from the original kitchen to get away with the remodel so they wouldn't have to spend as much money on providing with the new permits and for new construction permits so I had seen that, and the house that was there, the new house, was under construction during the period that we were building our house. Hold, hold on. So you're saying yeah. that for, for because of a technicality of law uh, to do with building there, part of that original terrible house was used to build what is there now? Yes, God. exactly. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you decide, I'm really interested in a piece of real estate uh, where I can maybe build my dream home. 150 feet away yeah it wasn't and by all means i was n i am not a death hag and a big fan of of sharon tate and i wasn't then i certainly um, i wouldn't say i am now i have a res deep respect for all of the people that were killed there but it's not like i'm a fanatic and oh sharon i've got pictures and posters no i have respect for the individuals i am not over fantasized about or fantasy you know fan base understood about so did you think well it's a notorious location but this is a great deal and i need somewhere to live well yeah and it had always been my dream to build a house that my with my father because my father was a builder architect designer and i said after he built my sister's house or my sister commissioned him to build her house 30 years earlier i said oh i, I was on the construction site then it's like i want to do this with my house too i want to be able to and it was fortuitous because the lot was a, it's a small little lot and it, it's on a very, very steep incline. But as my father said, I like to build houses on slopes because if they're more difficult, it gives me a more of a creative space to work with. And I was like, God bless you, Dad. Thank <laughs> that's, you. That's what you wanted to hear. Okay, hold that thought. We're going to come back to this because uh, what happened after that, not exactly entirely to plan. David Oman we're speaking with, and we'll talk with him a little more coming soon here on The Unexplained. Stay here. Online, on DAB, and on a talk radio app. Talk radio. We haven't got a lot of time to lose here. Straight back to David Oman in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, who bought a plot of land adjacent to, very close to, the scene of a notorious murder. The most notorious murder of the 1960s, maybe one of the most notorious murder cases of all time, and the name Charles Manson etched into infamy, like we said. All right, David, so with the help of your dad, you build a house there. Yes, yes, we did. And the thing is, is that 
when I first bought the lot, I had this weird feeling inside my head of like, you know, I feel like it's almost, I hate to say this, it's, it's um, fate that brought me here. And when I was walking around, I was like, well, you know, I said, I love it up here. It's the same feeling of where I grew up in the hills of, uh, in above Westwood Village. And to me, I love the fact that there were animals, there was wildlife. We have deer, coyote, bobcats, mountain lions and such. And I thought to myself, this is, it feels like home. I just had that sense of this is right. And during the construction, it was stranger because I'd be working on one of the floors, and the house is a three-story downslope, meaning the top floor is at street level, and you go down to your second lower level, and then to your third lower level. And when we were doing the construction, it was like I'd be walking around, and I'd have this weird sensation that there'd be sometimes somebody walking up upon me from behind me. And I'd turn around and say, all right, what's, and there'd be no one there. Wow. I I asked my contract laborers, I said, look, you guys have been here now for three years. Has any of you guys had any weird experiences during construction? And one guy goes, yeah. I said, I was on the third level six months ago in summer, and I heard voices and footsteps coming from the top floor at 6 p.m. when I was finishing up. So I come running upstairs to see you and your father, because your father was the head contractor, and I don't find anyone there. So I go out onto the driveway, I look up and down the driveway, and it's completely empty. And I said, well, yeah, I said, I, I come up here at like 6.30 during the weekdays in the summer, and it's empty because it's light and it's hot and no one's here. And he goes, yeah. I said, what do you mean? He goes, that's what I felt. No one was here. So he goes back downstairs, and he starts working, and five minutes later, his voices and footsteps again coming from the top floor. So he runs upstairs, and he's looking around. He says, there's no one there. He looks around the entire floor, goes back downstairs, and he starts packing his bags. Within about a few minutes, he hears the footsteps coming down the staircase, louder and louder as they're coming down the 30-foot spiral staircase. He says they got so loud, they got to the landing, he runs out of the room adjacent to the landing and looks, he says, there's no one there. But he says, then it happens. I said, what happens? He goes, this ice cold breeze, if you could call it that. And he goes, it really wasn't a breeze, though. It was like a two inch wide band of ice comes whizzing across the back of his neck, below his hairline and above his shoulder blades. And he says the hairs on his body stood straight up and he screamed, a dos mios, a dos mios, yame boy, yame boy which means, translate from Spanish, means, mm -hmm. oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. He didn't come back for some six weeks. I'm surprised he came back at all. Well, and I said to him, I said, you can't, he goes, yeah, he goes, I had to get paid for the prior three weeks. I didn't get paid for it. It's like, he says, but from that point on, I was always the first one to leave the job site mm -hmm. every single day that I was there from that point on. And I said, wait a second, that's when you were going to put in the tiles for the master bathroom and you didn't get around to it. So after the third week that you weren't here, I got so frustrated, I took it upon myself to put the tiles in the master bathroom. And let me tell you, as easy as these guys make it look to put in tile into a bathroom, I, 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 I got news for you. It is the most difficult accomplishment to do if you've never done it before. And let me tell you, it is not as easy as they make it look because to them it's secondhand. They know how to do what they've been doing a million times, slapping those tiles in. Well, well if, if they're available, they want to travel the Atlantic. I live in an apartment that is desperate for total renovation. And if they're as good as that, then, then I, I think I need them here. Okay, so, so when this place is being built, people are having experiences. What, oh, were yeah. you, what were you thinking and feeling then? Um, well, I was thinking like, all right, I know there's some points in the house that have always given me a little bit of the willies in, in a sense. And there's certain parts of the house that we would go into that you'd literally step onto the floor, including my laundry room. You step one foot up to the step that's part of the egress, the walkway going outside to the outside of the house or to the water heater. And when you hit that landing, you all of a sudden feel like you're rocking back and forth on a boat, like your equilibrium is being messed with. Mm. And I mean, I used to feel it all the time, but it would come and go in certain parts of the house and it would dissipate to the point where it's, no, it's not there. Nope, it's now, oh yeah, here it is, it's again. And other people would walk around the house and say, you know something, I feel like 
this heaviness and a pressure on my chest or I can't, I'm finding it difficult to breathe. I'm like having shortness of breath and other people were feeling the experience of being cold spots that were literally moving cold spots. And we're talking no air conditioning, no heating, no windows open, just moving cold spots in the house where you could put your hand through a space in the air and say, oh, it's chilly there. And then you pull it out and say, like, nope, it's not chilly on the other side, though. And then you put it back in and say, like, nope, now it's moving to the left. And it just strange, strange types of experiences that you'd say, that's not normal. And why did you make, since the Manson crimes did not happen on that site, why did you eventually make that connection? Well, what happened was, is um, after two years of living here, I started to feel, you know, I've had enough experiences here with my own personal thing, with my dog. I had a Rhodesian Ridgeback named Sebastian. Um, a little background, Ridgebacks don't bark unless there's a threat to their territory, and that's the reason why I bought my Rhodesian Ridgeback. Um, he used to bellow at the front door as if someone was gonna, about to knock the front door. We'd open the front door up, there'd be no one there. We would have knocks at the front door and open the door and there would be no one there. And it wasn't like the neighbor's kids were doing ding dong ditch. It was literally that kind of stuff was happening. Mm. Faucets were turning on by themselves in front of guests in the bathroom. My friend ran out saying, I just went to the try to go to the bathroom and as I'm taking going taking a leak in the toilet, the, the, the faucet turns on right behind me and I turn around to look to see the faucets are on full bore and I just freaked out and ran out of there. I'm, just, I, I'm sure our British listeners know, but uh, I'm sorry for being Mr. Explainer, but we call them taps here. The taps, right. Yeah. And, and it's amazing because I had never seen that and I was upset saying, all right, spirits, you did that for them. When are you going to do it for me? I want to be privy to this. I deserve to have the experience, not my guests. This is unfair. And people go, you're serious. And it's like, yes, I am darn, darn serious. I want to experience a paranormal activity in my own home and not let it be known and let it be known that I'm curious. I'm not afraid. Let's see it. Let's have the action be brought upon us. So I brought in a paranormal research group in 2004. I think it was on the 9th of August. And they had never been here to the house. There was no history. I had not been on any television shows. I said, I want to do a paranormal investigation on the anniversary of the murders. Can you guys come over? So Rob Wardowski and Al McCary, their psychic, and Rob's wife came over to the house with another two people. And the six of us were, the, I guess, early in the evening, at about five o'clock, me, Rob, Al McCary, and Rob's wife were in the house. Rob, myself, and, and uh, his wife went outside to talk about something, and Al McCary, the psychic, who was here for the very first time, was sitting in the dining room. I come back in the house five minutes later, and mind you, we're the only people in the house, period. There's no one else there. And Alma says, we go, oh, I just saw your girlfriend. And my jaw got a little slack down. I said, huh, what? And she goes, oh, I just saw her. And she just walked downstairs. And I said, um, and, and of course, knowing what I know, that's not the case. So I said, I acted dumb. And I said, oh, can you describe my, can you describe her for me? Instead of me telling her what I was about to say, which was my girlfriend's not here what are you talking about? And all that stuff to set her off. I thought, no, ask her the simple questions. What did she see? Don't make her feel uncomfortable. Don't make her feel like something out of the ordinary took place. Just go along with it. So I said, so what did, what did she look like? And she says, well, she's about five foot five, five foot six. She had long blonde hair. It was pulled back behind in, in, in her back. It was pulled in like a knot at the base mm -hmm. that then flew, you know, was going down, flowing down. I said, uh-huh. She goes, she was wearing a white sundress. She had, she had uh, naked legs, meaning she didn't have stockings. She had very shapely legs. She turned as she was walking from the, the den past the bar counter. She turned and she looked and she smiled at me and acknowledged me and continued to walk towards the staircase and made her way down the stairs. And I looked at her and I said, really? I said, you positive about this? She goes, as positive as you can be. Why? 
I said, well, because my girlfriend doesn't believe in the paranormal, therefore she's not here. And secondly, and more importantly, she is about six feet tall. She has long chestnut, straight chestnut brown hair, and she's model esque, but she is certainly not blonde. She is not five foot six. She is not. And she goes, Well, I know what I saw. And it's like I said, I brought a picture that I had of Sharon Tate. A candid shot of hers that wasn't a publicity shot, and I said, "Is I said, could this be who you saw?" And she goes, "That's who I saw. That's her." And my jaw dropped, and I said, "I put my hand in my face. I said, um, that's Sharon Tate. She died some forty, some thirty-five years ago tonight at oh. the end of the street." And she goes, "Well, that's who I saw." And I was like, "Okay, that's it." And you're sure that these things did not happen just because you're living in a famous location, that drive, and you know, it was an anniversary and you're all conditioned to it? Well, the thing is, is that she, we, I, I told Rob, I told Rob the story, I said, Rob, I don't want anyone, not even your wife, knowing much about this. Mm -hmm. But of course, Rob told his wife because his wife wanted to know. But I said, I said, that's fine. He says, did you tell Alma anything? He goes, no. He says, we brought her up here and that was it. She came with us and we didn't mention anything about it. And she wasn't, you know, paying attention to where we were going and looking at the street signs and stuff. So she didn't know any of this. And it wasn't, I said, I want to keep it under wraps so that she's in the dark, so that it's not overtly obvious that this is what she's creating in her mind's eye. Right. Okay. Understood. And, and, so the and, by the, and one last thing, I had not been on any TV shows. I hadn't done any radio programs. This is the very, very, very genesis of this whole experience in the house. So no one had, <laughs> there's no history outside of, as you say, the history excuse me, that took place down the street, but nothing related to the paranormal activity that is now known about the house and so forth. So you'd have to say it was the dark ages for this place. There was no nothing known about it. It was an unknown. All right. Got you, as we say here. Um, we've got five minutes remaining, so we've got a lot of ground to cover here. One of the things that uh, has come out of paranormal and haunting stories that we've told here on this show many, many times is that they start in a fairly benign kind of way. People see things, they hear the odd bump, maybe something gets moved, maybe the temperature goes down and that's it. Uh, those occurrences at your place did not stop with those things. Oh, no, no. We've had things, like I mentioned earlier, the faucets have turned on. I've had objects move a port, which means that they're there one minute, then they disappear, literally physically disappear and reappear in some other part of the house. I've had objects slide on their own, move on their own. I had a glass of wine slide across the dining room table about eight inches, three quarters of the way filled with wine in front of five other people besides myself here for a dinner party. The curious point of that story was is the woman had a direct connection to Sharon Tate as a child. And her family and Sharon Tate's family back in the day, we later on found out, in Texas used to get together for picnics and parties and stuff. And it was kind of one of those things you'd say, oh, my God, how did you not know? We didn't find this out until two days after their visit. So there are things that have happened here. And I like to say that benign everything in the paranormal, people are going to hate me for this, but the fact is, is that it's about your perception to the incidents of the paranormal that create the or tint the perception of it being good or bad. Meaning that spirits aren't rattling chains and trying to scare human beings that are still alive. I do not ascribe to the Charles Dickens dramatical Got it. response. To so paranormal. why do you think the spirits and Sharon Tate in particular are trying to reach out to you? Well, Lisa Williams, the famous English psychic, was here, um, oh, 14 years ago after I was on Ghost Hunters, um, and she saw the house, and she said to me that she was communicating with Sharon, and Sharon had expressed to her that she likes this house, that she likes me, that she wanted her story mm -hmm. told, and so much so that about 15, well, God, 16 years ago in 2004, 
on one of my walks down the driveway, I said out loud, I said, I need some a break here. I need to get some some kind of direction in my life. I'd like to find some something that I can fall into that I really enjoy. I've done so many different things. And Sharon Spirit gave me this vignette of a guy, myself, driving up the driveway um, past the second house and seeing her apparition there. And I wrote this down, this incident down, and it turned out to be the first of many experiences that are visions that I had, courtesy of Sharon, to um, create the story, House at the End of the Drive, which is the movie that I produced and co-wrote about this man that buys a house on a private drive down the street from these terrible murders, but the spirits are trying to um, get closure and get something out of the new homeowner. So effectively, that, that person is you, and just quickly, because yes. we're coming to the back end of yes. this, there's never enough time to do these things, but what do you say to people who say that Sharon Tate died in the most horrendous circumstances, and really, you know, if you believe that she's around you in this place, you shouldn't really be, some people might say it's bad taste for you to be talking about this. I think that those people are, are how she's turning a blind eye to the people that are out there that have created this cottage industry about demythologizing Manson's partaking in the murders and these people's culpabilities and looking for responsibility other than those that committed the murders. In other words, you're saying that by revealing what's, what you think is going on where you live and by doing the things you've done, you're keeping that story out there so people don't blur it. Right. I'm here basically in a sense, well, beyond the Sharon Tate victims that visits the house, the house is visited by thousands of other spirits as well, which we found out. But for Sharon's, for my part with Sharon, I'm here, I'm here basically as a mouthpiece to venerate her memory okay. and to remember their memory as people, not as victims, but as people that had lives ahead of them and that they should never be dismissed as such more than a footnote to history as they have been so far in the portrayals of them. Okay, I, I hear what you say. I totally understand what you're saying. And you say other things happen there. We've only got 60 seconds, but uh, can you give me an example of, uh, you know, something that uh, my listener might find scary? Yeah, well, I saw the apparition of Jay Sebring, one of the victims down the street 15 years ago, about seven months before my mother passed away of pancreatic cancer. And um, his apparition did not look anything like the way he was dressed when he left this earth. And when he died, and also he didn't look as terribly mor morbid and disgraced, I guess, disfigured as he was when he was killed. So people should realize that spirits are coming back to visit you, to see how you're doing, to check up on you, to say hello, to be there for you, not to be scaring you. <laughs> well, I think a lot of people who live in houses that may have um, you know, apparitions and stuff like that are going to be very pleased to hear you say that. If people want to check you out online, you have a great website. What is it? That would be theomenhouse.com, and they can go to, that's T-H-E-O-M-A-N, house.com, and youtube.com forward slash David Omen. And, of course, my book, ghostsofcielodrive.com, for the new book, Ghosts of Cielo Drive. David, we'll talk again. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing this with us. What a story, and what a chilling account of things that are still going on. David Oman, we're totally out of time. Thank you very much to my producer, Reese. Thank you to technical producer, Sarah. And uh, Paul Ross is coming right up next here on Talk Radio. So until next we meet here on The Unexplained on Talk Radio, please stay safe, please stay calm, and above all, please stay in touch. Take care, sleep well, good night. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker, The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Radio.